Hi, my name is Jim Lukens, and I have always loved this life. Thank you, Jim, for in inviting me into Rise Sales and uh, the opportunity to uh, tell your story. Well, as they say, Warren, the pleasure is all mine. I'm thrilled to have you here. We've been friends for a long time, and uh, I'm the one that's thrilled and honored, really. Well, Jim, as you know, um, I was launching what was then D3 TV a few years back, right. and that was when you and I got to meet each other for the very first time. Right, and I've always been a news hound, absolutely a news hound. And when I saw that uh, somebody was set up there filming the D3 race, man, I was all about it. I wanted to find out what you were doing. And that was, of course, in the very early days. And <laughs> you've done a wonderful job. You're just wonderful. The early days for you. We're, we're in Hudsonville, Michigan. Right. Is this home for you? Is this where you grew up? Well, you know, Hudsonville is a southwest suburb of Grand Rapids. And I was, I was actually born in East Grand Rapids, grew up in Grand Rapids. Lived a lot of my years uh, in Kentwood by Berger. And then about 20 years ago, this building became available and had room to put 24 cars inside. So I, I said, I'm all about it. So I've been here 21 years and loved, pretty much loved every minute of it. Well, you're certainly a car guy. There's no question about it. But it started at the very beginning uh, when I was uh, 10 years old, I went over to my grandfather's house. He belonged to AAA, and they have a little, just a nothing little magazine they send out each month. But that issue happened to be the new car issue. They were there talking in there and showing the Mercedes Gullwing. And I just, that's the coolest car I've ever seen. I'm a car guy. That's the coolest car. I'm going to have one someday. I didn't know what I was saying or what they cost or anything. I just decided at that day I'm going to have one. Well, it took me until into my 30s before I could afford them, and until into my 40s till I got my going. But I worked along and, and kept on the path, and eventually got there, and I'm still there to this day. Well, tell me about your youth and the hot rotting bug and cars and your growing up years. How how you developed that. Um, affinity for cars. <laughs> well, I think I, I think I was born with it. I always tell this story that when I was five, my parents had a '50 Chevy, uh, brand new, and I would stand on the front seat between them because I couldn't see out the window if I sat down, and I'd call out the cars, '47 Nash, '49 Buick, and they would say, "How do you know that? How do you even know this?" And uh, because I was going back to the Newshound days, my grandpa used to have a lot of the magazines, Holiday, Life, Look, and all that. And I memorized the car as and what the cars looked like. And uh, it just kind of grew from there. So I've been a, I've been a car guy uh, um, every day of my life. But the equally most important thing is really how lucky I've been. I've always been in the just it seems like in the perfect place to just to take advantage of the situation and if you if you apply yourself um, then you can go to the next level you know Raymond Beetle said that luck was when opportunity met prep, uh, preparation and that's, I've been lucky I'm as lucky as any three people you ever met but um, I paid the price too. As every one of your guys that I've listened to, they all paid their price in their own way. But I had built, I decided um, I was going to build a junior stocker. That was a time when junior stockers were highly respected. I mean, it was, there was like top fuel and junior stock. And there's some other stuff in between, don't get me wrong. But that was a, the class that you really had to think, and you couldn't do anything. So how do you make something go better without doing anything? And uh, 
I, I took a look at the, the um, situation and I studied the NHRA classification guide because I knew that I wanted to have a car that fell at the top of a certain class. And I knew, I knew I wanted to be a Pontiac. So I found two or three possibility body styles and believe it or not, I went out and found one of those body styles, the 57 Pontiac two-door wagon, like a 150 Chevy. They only ever made 1,700 of them that year. That was the next rarest car besides the Safari that's like a nomad. I believe it, I found one. So I, I chose that as my car to build. And I built it. The, the, the car was very trick. I, had just, I just can't stress how trick it was. But it, once again, it was all great people. Norm Dragu, which now would you call a crew chief, he was my crew chief. Hall of Fame engine builder Tom Straley was my engine builder. Um, I used to say that I had an unlimited budget and I spent every penny of it. It's not that way now, but it was that way when I was coming up. So. I built this car and it was okay. I really understood all the things that we talk about now, about rollout and reaction time and packages. You know, in the old days, you came whizzing down there about 100 miles an hour at the finish line and there were three cones lined up, 66 feet before, 60, uh, finish line, 66 feet after. I saw that people didn't even know which one of the three lines was really the finish line. It was pretty naive then. And the car did okay. Um, it would have done better if I would worked on it more. I didn't like to get my hands dirty. I still don't. Um, but it was okay. What I didn't understand at that very young age, I understood a lot of things about the weight brake and the classes and the horsepowers. But I didn't know yet about things like rod angle ratio and bore to stroke ratio. And seeing 58, they bored the Pontiacs out, I kept the same stroke, and it gave them a much better bore to stroke ratio. So, you know, in my day, there was two 58 Pontiac world champions. And uh, now I understand why got, they got there and I didn't. Uh, but we did okay. And it was at that time that I came to Berger, because at that time, Berger was the only really heavy duty place in town. We had a couple of speed shops, but if, if you really, like I, I was looking for an offset cam key, which obviously they had to order, but they were only a person that even understood what I was talking about. So I became a somewhat frequent customer of Berger, and I ran the car, and right about halfway through that, Wayne Jessel went to California and convinced NHRA that the Chevy sedan deliveries came with the four-speed high dramatic. That was one of the real big deals of the Pontiac. It had the four-speed high dramatic. So I was racing the guys, the Chevy guys, all they had was the two-speed cast iron power glide. Well, they didn't have a chance. But when Wayne Jessel convinced NHRA that the sedan delivery deal was legal, in one year, the sedan deliveries held every record from F automatic to N automatic, which was the lowest class at that time, because they got the three years and they got the two engine sizes and they got three or four induction sizes and they got two camshafts, solid and hydraulic. And you could, you could make, somehow find a sedan delivery that made every class. The F, F was the very biggest 283 fuel injected solid liquor. The end was a little, uh, you know, a two barrel, 265. But what it did was, it obsoleted a lot of really good cars of all brands, because it just became, that was kind of the start of the Chevy only era. And it just became a, a Chevy deal. Um, there was a guy here in town that had a 60 Ford Starliner. It was a very cool, beautiful car, but when they put the automatics in the sedan delivery, that was the end of it. So, uh, in the process of going to Berger, Bob Delamar was the high performance manager, and he was talking about 
um, expanding. It, Berger was going pretty good. He was doing it by himself, the high performance part. And he said, oh, why don't you go to work here? Uh, you're here all the time anyway. Why don't you just come to work here? Well, that's a great offer. And the one thing that struck me about every story you've told so far, about every person, there came a point in their career where it was the go or blow moment, where they either had to make a great sacrifice to make a change, or they could continue on. Well, I was at Kroger's. I was kind of working my way up, a hot, young, hot gun kind of guy, you know. And uh, to go to work at Berger would have taken and required about a 25% dis or, you know, reduction in pay. Uh, but at that time, I was single and I lived at home, and I thought, well, you know, I loved, I loved cars so much, I just got to get involved. And if I, if I don't do it now, I, this is my chance. So I took the pay cut and went to work there. Within about a year and a half, I was the manager. And Dale Berger Jr., who was the owner, it's a fourth generation, they're still in business today, 90 years, founded in 1925, I mean five years. And he was a kind of a hot young guy himself, and he, figured out, well, this, he, by the way, he's the smartest guy that ever went through GMI, which was the Tech General Motors Institute, the Tech Training Center. And he figured out that for every guy that could afford, let's say a 454 Chevelle or whatever it might be, which uh, some other people, other dealers really made hay promoting stuff like that, that there were a thousand guys that needed a camshaft to run Saturday night at their local drag strip, their local circle track, whatever. So from the very beginning, uh, he had the idea to, the deal was that for him was the parts, wasn't doing the car conversions and the engine conversions. So at that point, we had good backing. He was already the third generation. They were financially solid. And he, he just kind of gave me the reins and let me do whatever I wanted, and, and we went crazy. Now, once again, we paid the price. We were very busy. We ran a lot of ads. And if they turned on the phones at 8 o'clock in one second, our phone was ringing at 8 o'clock in two seconds. And it just it never stopped ringing. And uh, eventually I grew the department, I had three guys working with me. And it just turned out uh, uh, to be quite a deal. I was in the right place. You know, at that time there was about 5,000 Chevy dealers in the United States. The one that I grew up only about a mile away, a Berger, was Berger. I could have grown up any of the 5,000, but I was in this town with Berger at the available when they had an opening. And so it always comes back to the same thing, being ready, being ready to profess, uh, pro, you know, like apply yourself and take advantage of the opportunity. So Berger turned out to be a, a really good deal. We uh, did lots of famous stuff. And I had a feeling when we were doing that, that we were doing something pretty special. Uh, it just, we worked long hours. Your phones would ring all day, like I said. So we would, uh, at six o'clock when we closed, and the guys, my guys and me would take a break. We'd go out to dinner with our wives or girlfriends. And then about 7.30, we'd kind of loosely assemble back. And then we packed every day until about 11 at night because we knew the orders we'd taken we couldn't save them until the next day at 8 o'clock in two seconds because there'd be no chance. So, once again, we all paid the price and we loved doing it. It was fun. Got to talk to lots of famous racers, obviously. And uh, it was a big deal, good deal. And like I say, what I started to say was I had a feeling it was something special. But way back then, 50 years ago, I never could have envisioned how special it was. I mean, I just thought it was okay, you know, kind of cool. And, you know, every year I go to the McHacken show in uh, Chicago, they have me as one of their guest speakers, and people come from all around the country and just want to hear my Burgess story, and then they'll say, 
man, can you come over and autograph my dashboard or whatever? And so to have that going on after 50 years is just unbelievable. So it was while I was at Berger that Mr. Gasket recruited me. And a lot of things I'm gonna say, I gotta say modestly, but I just thought I needed to be up on the big stage. You know, I thought I was bigger, uh, not in an egotistical way, but I just thought my talents were bigger than just lurking at this dealership. So they recruited me. I weighed it pretty heavy because that Berger gig was a pretty good gig. I remember Dale Berger Jr. said to me, what do you think? I said, I'm scared to death. And I was, but I had to do it. So I, I went to work for Mr. Gasket. I was there 11 years. I was there during the, the first reign of Joe Redka. And then he sold to W.R. Grace, a big conglomerate, top Fortune 50 company. And uh, then he, uh, Grace kind of ran it in the ground and then he bought it back. So I like to say I was for, there for the era of Joe one, Grace and Joe two. Okay. But along the way, while the conglomerate um, owned it, they ran it down a lot. And one thing they did was uh, the salesmen, like myself, were on straight commission. No base, no draw, no nothing. We had to front our own expenses to go on the road and buy gas and stay in motels. And then we got a commission. Well, long about 84, they decided the salesmen were making too much money. Was because it's ridiculous because that was only one little portion of what they were making. But they cut our uh, commission rate. And I didn't like it because I used to work hard. I'd work every day until five. And then I spent three hours or so driving at night to the next town because, you know, the, you know, there's a couple hundred miles between the big towns. So I paid the price once again. I drove, drove at night, gave up stuff, only to have them cut my commission. So there were three or four really, I don't know, high risers, I guess, and none of us took it very well. So in 86, they cut it again. And like the old saying, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. I said, I'm out of here. I don't have, I don't have any idea, but there's no reason for me to be pushing this hard and, and be treated like that. And the good guys left and, you know, for the most part, Mr. Gass has been in a tailspin for the last 40 years. It's not like it was when you and I were growing up. Now, they do okay, but they're not just that cornerstone of the whole performance industry. But one thing that I've been blessed with was a really good comprehension of numbers. I can see something and I pronounce it like those long GM part numbers. And numbers always came, it was a gift, I don't take any credit for it, but it was a gift. And along the way, several people, several companies, had asked me when I was at Mr. Gasket and their affiliated companies to draw, to develop a part numbering system for them. Aeroquip, which is right here in Jackson, would be a good idea, you know, a good example, of a 50 year old company. But they had a lot of calls to enter high performance. But they didn't know where to start. So they said to me, will you come here and live here and develop our numbering system. That's the first thing you got to have. You have a numbering system, then you have a price sheet. That's how you go to market. So, yeah, I can do that. So I did. And they had, because they are in so many other industries, aerospace and manufacturing, it had to fit within a very narrow little band. And the performance industry, especially at that time, had a seven digit uh, kind of like the old Hearst numbers that was accepted as the industry norm, uh, three numbers, hyphen, four numbers. So it, it took some time to take their products 
and, and fit it into their band and still speak the language of the high performance industry that they wanted to enter. Uh, there's some other ones, but that, that's the gist of it. So I was always blessed with this gift uh, for dealing with numbers. And I thought, well, there'll be something. I, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't have any clients. Um, but somehow from that day, all those years ago, 86 to today, a long time ago, 34 years, I think, um, it's just been one thing after another. And along the way, when I got go back to the Mr. Gasket. Jim Vaughn was there, sales manager. He'd been at Hearst. If you remember the year when Hearst took the 10,000 gold hats to Indy and Everybody had to have a Hearst hat. That was the deal. They sold him, but he was a marketing genius, very polite guy, and he was just, once again, at that time, at that moment, he was the perfect person. Perfect person for me to learn from. So I started out bravely, and a couple of people said they, uh, you know, they wanted me to help them. The first was C.J. Batten, and I'll tell you, C.J. is the single smartest person. He's de dead now. He's the single smartest person I ever met, and I mean, it's not even close. He's like up here, and the whole rest of the world starts like this and goes down. So I did his marketing for two years. I actually had, a, had an office in Detroit because it was too hard to commute, and I used to go down on Monday and come back on Friday. And we did some great things, and unfortunately he got a, he had an OEM division that kind of got caught up in that GM strike of 98, and he was supplying 1,100 heads, aluminum heads a day for the Corvette. He was supplying every head that they put on any Corvette they built. So obviously he had a whole assembly line, he had people, he had materials, and then in 98 we had that huge strike uh, the GM auto workers had that strike and they were down for um, several months and then when he came back you know they were so starved per product that they just they said okay we're gonna start with trucks we gotta start somewhere we're gonna start with trucks and we're just gonna build out our portfolio as we get each plant back online and we'll add the next one well in the whole Chevrolet scheme of things Corvette was at the very bottom, that's the least important. So, but what that did for CJ was it just, in one night it just turned off his water. He's got this whole building, this assembly line, employees, materials, and in one night it just shut off like for six months. So unfortunately, great guy, smart guy, but really uh, the OEMs were the end of them, you know. But I learned a lot from him and Long about the time his deal was winding down, I bumped into an old friend of mine, Roger Rosebush. So Roger was at SEMA that year, as he and I are every year. And seen him had you know such a big place even back then, you don't bump into everybody that's there that you know. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But when I was walking out on the last day, he was sitting on the stairs there from the lower level of the convention center where you go up to the mezzanine level of the convention center and he said uh, he was working in New Jersey he was working on a working with a wheel company from Brazil that, that wanted to break into the US market and they tried to do it with their own people but it, it was just too hard you know they spoke another language it, it, nothing worked for them so they hired him, he moved to New Jersey. He says to me, can you make an application guide? Yeah. No, yeah. And he said, well, I want an application guide. Everybody, every wheelman, it's a terrible, terrible, costly job. Every wheel manufacturer says, buy our wheels. Use somebody else's guide to look them up and see what fits your car. Because in reality, a wheel guide has got, even if there was less cars then than there are now, you know, but it's still got about 10,000 boxes. 
and into every single one of those boxes you got to figure out if they make a wheel with the right bolt pattern and the right offset and the right rear spacing and all that that'll fit on that car and I walked out of there thinking like okay what do I do now but we persevered got it done it was really a, it truly was a big hit because there was n nobody done anything like that in the wheel industry so my goal even when I'd been a rep I always wanted to win one of the best new awards it seemed that was one of the real cornerstones of, of what I wanted to accomplish but I was never eligible technically because I was a so-called company man rather than an independent rep but when I saw that what we'd done I said to Roger if you give me the budget I can win that best new catalog award he says do you think you can I, there's no thinking about it I know I can so he stretched and gave me the budget and you know it's, it's like a lot of these racers today especially the oval track guys they can have all the talent in the world but if they don't have the sponsor to carry them all the way through to the big stage their talents never going to be known or be shown and I, I feel the same way I once we could do it I understood it but then you had to have the, the sponsor to underwrite it because it, it turned out to be a pretty elaborate deal we made a little embossed folder with their logo embossed on the cover and um, took it to SEMA won the award so and it's in the trophy case to this day it's right in the center on the top the biggest one um, sounds pretty thrilled and I gotta thank Roger I've done a lot of stuff for him even as recently as yesterday he's got his own company now but we've had a lot of fun we're a great mix he's a great idea guy I'm kind of a plotter so he dreams up all these crazy things and then I got to figure out how to do them Roger gave you the opportunity to win that award but you've continued to develop catalogs and other materials for other companies. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, as our fame started to grow, other companies approached us. We never really solicited anybody. It all just be, kind of became uh, from happenstance, from word of mouth. And we just kind of kept growing and going. And there was a funny car here in Division Three that I did powder coating on the back of the car it said uh, the only thing better about California is the weather I always felt that way about here there's, there's talent out there there's talent back here they got better weather but that doesn't give them an exclusive on the talent either so I just kept marching down the road a step at a time putting one foot in front of the other and the opportunities kept opening up did it ever scare you to not be part of a big corporate operation to just hang your shingle out and go out no, on your own? No. You know, uh, years ago, years and years ago, there was a man named Gil Armamillo. Gil was the vice president of GE under Jack Welch. And that was a time when Jack Welch like, was like this god of business principles and all that. and. Uh, Apple was pretty shaky. They kicked Steve Jobs out the first time. And a reporter said to him, to Gil, why would you leave such a golden position at uh, GE to go to such a shaky position as Apple? And he said, because if you're not your own man, sooner or later you're going to get done. That says it all. I cut that out of the USA Today and where I, my office was in the old place. I had a cork board right here on the wall and I tacked stuff up. I put that right there and I looked at it every day because that's the deal. I decided after the Grace experience, no one else is going to decide my future or where, where I work or when I work or if I have a job, you know. Uh, my, my sister works in the pharmaceutical industry. My God, they go through downsizing 
every other year. And so she's, she's worked there 20 years in terror almost the whole time. I don't want, I, I couldn't put up with that. You know, I, uh, I just, that's not even my, that's not my nature. Do you think that Berger would be on the map like it is today had you not taken that opportunity? Boy, that's a loaded question because they're great people. I'm still very fond of them. I'm still a Berger boy. We got the Berger sign hanging up here. I still still do some speaking on their behalf and about them and about our days. Um, I would say, yeah, because there's such good management, such good funding, they would have got through somehow. I mean, I, I, I was like this one key in the whole cog, but I, I give them a lot of credit. They're great people. So I, I, I'm not worried about them. The flip side of that is, would you be where you are today had you not had the Berger experience? Wow. You know, the short answer would be no. But the little longer answer would be the same thing I said about Berger. I would have got there too. But Berger just kind of gave me a fast track right to the, right into the mainstream. And if it wasn't them, I'd have found a fast track, whether it was Aeroquip, which is nearby or whatever. Um, there would have been somebody, but Berger just kind of gave me a jump start and got me going early, young, got me going young. You know, Warren, I started there when I was um, teens, late teens. I left there when I was 27. Everything I did, and Berger did, was a long time ago, too. I mean, I just marvel, I keep going back to it, that this stuff is so important now. I mean, the internet is what changed things. Um, before, I mean, we didn't know what we were doing I, I, in the whole big scheme of things. I'll give you an example. GMAC comes around every month, and if they've got your car's floor, pan, floor planned at your dealership, they come around and take inventory. Make sure all the cars that you're claiming are there, which uh, they do that for every dealer, you know. So I was working on one day working away, and this guy from GMAC came to the counter. And he said, uh, we got this car. We can't figure out what it is. And I said, well, tell me what, you know, tell me about it. Well, he said, it's a Camaro. It's got this great big engine. Doesn't have any markings on it. I said, I'll buy it. He said, well, we don't know what it is. I said, doesn't matter. I said, I know what it is. It was Copo, one of the original Copos. So, uh, yeah, I said, I'll buy it. It was a hugger orange. And so I did. Well, it turns out now, you know, and now with the internet, all these 50 years later, it was a rubber bumper car of which all the Copo Camaro only, in the cast iron version, only 58 were ever made with rubber bumpers because they were heavy. You didn't want the weight up front. So most of, 99% of the people sourced a rubber bumper. I mean, I'm sorry, a steel bumper, you know, keep the car light, keep the front end light to race it. So here I had a Copo, pretty nicely equipped. It was a, it was a RS um, rubber bumper. Quite a few options, really. It was in hugger orange, the real iconic color from 69. So I actually owned a hugger orange 69 Copo. But, you know, I had fun with it for a couple of years and I got an offer. I paid 1500 for it. After a couple of years, I just had fun fooling around on the street with it. And a guy from Wisconsin offered me 1900 And I thought, well, that's a pretty good return. So I sold it to Wisconsin. And of course now, you know, they're a lot. They've come down a little from their high point, but, but one thing I've never done is I've always been thrilled with what I've got. I'm thrilled with the cars I got today. And you'll hear people say, oh, I wish I had the 57 Chevy I had in high school. I've never felt like that. I'm glad for what I got, 
I'm glad for what I had. We had some people here yesterday and uh, they were talking about they owned their Corvette 49 years. And I thought, well, sure, but you would have had to insure it those 49 years and you had to store it those 49 years. So even if you theoretically make a profit on paper, you spend a lot of money along the way. So uh, I'm strictly about going forward. Uh, you'll never see me look back. You'll never hear me look back. I had great times, great experiences, but that was another time and this is this time. Tell me a little bit about Rise Sales, the genesis of that and where it is today. Well, it, as it, you know, when uh, uh, the Mr. Gasket family, W.R. Grace, cut our commission rate for the second time, then I said, uh, I'm out of here. So at that time, our particular division of Grace was known as the PACE division, P-A-C-E, which stood for Performance and Customizing Equipment. I, I like the, I thought it was kind of a dumb name myself, but I like the idea it was a short name. And um, at that time, a lot of people were saying, Joe Blow and Associates, Performance Unlimited, and I just thought that was way too much. I thought rise was like rising up, that's what it meant, and making better tomorrow than what it is today. It was short, and for my needs it worked, and it carries on to this day. Um, there were years when we were very busy. There were years when I paid the price. Um, now, the last few years, as we've had a client fall away for whatever reason, we haven't replaced them. So uh, the business is kind of um, floating down at about the same time as, as my capabilities are floating down. I still come in, when I'm in town, I still come in every day. I work from about noon to four. Um, I don't, I'm not a nine to five guy anymore, but there's still plenty to do and I still like doing it. So I'm still doing it. <laughs> Was Rise always engaged with racing and motorsports? I exclusively, I exclusively. We've had some other people come to us, um, lots of performance people, but for instance, there's a, there's a firm here in town that molds the taillight for an F-150. Got the contract, got the molds. Well, they thought, man, we should we should make a custom taillight for an F-150. We'd sell zillions of them. So I, they asked me to come over there on the other side of town by the airport. I came over. And they never could get past the point that in the performance industry you had to pay for the tooling. They were used to the manufacturers paying for the tooling and them making the parts. So they, they weren't a good fit. Their product would have been a great fit. Uh, especially, I mean, that was a long time ago, so they'd be really great now. But they just couldn't, they could never wrap their arms around the idea that they had to pay for the tooling. That's the way, in the aftermarket performance, we don't have anybody. We pay for our own tooling, and we sell the product. We don't have anybody, you know, silver spoon or whatever to fall back on. And that's really a double-edged sword, because when you got these big contracts, um, look at what happened this year with the pandemic or any of these years. Um, you might have an order for so many thousand units a day and then tomorrow you don't have an order for any units a day. You know, the production lines were shut down for a couple months. So once again, it goes back to my, th I'd rather just be my own deal, in charge of my own destiny, and it's just a good fit for me. I'd like to ask you about a couple of your client companies that really stand out to me from others. Um, Bill Reichert. Tell me about Bill. Well, that's another good story, another story of being in the right place at the right time. Bill had always run like D-Mod with a small block Camaro. He had the idea to make a uh, alcohol dragster. Uh, he got it done after a while, he got it done in the middle of the season, middle of the year. He took it to Great Lakes, 
And he won the very first points meet he ever went to, period. So I thought that bowled pretty well. Well, at that time, we still had a NHRA points meet at Martin. And he called me up and he said, you know, I'm coming to Martin. I heard about me from somebody. He said, would you, um, uh, you know, would you stop by our pit? I just want to meet you and talk to you. So I did and we agreed. You know, Bill's a great guy, one of the greatest, one of the smartest. But he only ever says about two words. You know, you've been to the bank where he says, uh, I'd like to thank my family and friends. And that's, that's his whole acceptance speech because he's not a talker. I, I can't stop talking. So we made a perfect pair. And I saw what, things, what Bars Leaks Rizlone was doing. I saw they had a sign on the tower at Milan. I saw him doing some other stuff, but I never thought they hit the home run and they deserved and what they were willing to spend. So I identified them uh, along with Bill as one of the key people. We finally got an appointment and uh, at that time Bill still raced and they wanted us to come on a Monday at 3.30 after the production line shut down. And uh, it happened that the particular Monday they chose, Bill had raced the previous day in English Town. So, and as he did, he drove all night. He drove the rig, he drove all night. He'd get back about 7 a.m. He'd uh, get a couple hours sleep, and then he'd go into work because he ran his machine shop. He had employees. And I'll never forget, they want us there at 3.30. I said, Bill, I'll pick you up at 1. Okay. So I picked him up, and he slept. Well, I drove my old Pontiac wagon, and we went to Bars Leaks, and the rest is history. They were great people. They've been great supporters, great product. That's funny, funny really, because they're selling a, at that time just a stop leak, and as you know, you don't run water and alcohol blocks anyway. You don't have a cooling system, so there was no there was no match up there at all that I could see. But it was they were the right it was the right fit and. He went on to be certainly the most decorated and celebrated alcohol racer. Uh, there's a couple right at the top there, Rick Santos, a uh, couple of them. But he's got most of the, he's got all the records except for one or two. Most wins, most runner-up. That record he set at 510 back in 07 still stands, as Bob Fry said this year, it's the longest standing NHRA record. Now, I know that in the meantime, they've cut the nitro back a little bit. But nonetheless, his record still stands all the way from 07. So it was a good fit. And he, once again, he was ready. They signed on. He got their money. Went straight to the top. So you got to, the money is such a big deal. You know, how many alcohol racers are there that would be the next Bill Reichert? if they had a major sponsor. There's, I'm sure there's lots of them, but he was in the right place at the right time, and we are together 22 years. Um, and I still do some stuff, as you know. Um, it was just luck, right place at the right time, and making the most of what I was handed and what he was handed. Oh, it never changes. One of your other client companies is very well known worldwide, and I had the privilege a few years ago to attend a ceremony where you received a very special award from your friends at Mercedes-Benz. Tell me about your relationship with Mercedes and ultimately the award that you received. Well, as I told at the beginning, it started when I was 10 years old and I fell in love with the Galway. I finally got into my 30s and 40s and could afford them. And then because I'm a writer, I started doing some stuff for him. And then it led to more and more. And the people say to me, well, my gosh, Mercedes has got uh, millions of employees around the world. What do you do that they couldn't do for themselves? I say, well, here's one example. Um, about 10 years ago, Mercedes built a new showplace dealership in Manhattan. 
They never had a good place. They kept out growing where they were. And so finally they went up on 11th Street out from Jacob Javits and they bought the whole block between 53rd and 54th. And they just leveled the whole block and built in, put up a one block, five story, 330,000 square foot showroom. So the gal that I was working with in the marketing, they had said to Daimler, you know, we've got a long history in Manhattan, which they do. Um, send over some pictures from a hundred years ago. Because originally, William Steinway, the piano guy, licensed a Mercedes to make it in America. Built a plant on Long Island. But the plant burned down pretty, pretty quickly. And so he just didn't have the heart to put it up again. So Daimler sent over these 20 pictures. And they were from a hundred years ago. And the captions were in German. And this poor gal says, can you figure out what's going on in these pictures? Oh yeah, yeah. I, no matter what the answer is, I can do it. I mean, I'm, just like Lutz said in 08, we're gonna have an electric car by 10. He just said, I don't know how we're gonna get there, but we'll get there. So that's the same answer I learned from him. Whatever, yeah, I can do that. But once again, luckily, I had a friend of mine, a lawyer from Princeton, New Jersey, who was educated in Manhattan at Cornell, got his law degree. And so I sent him the pictures. That's something I could figure out. But I said, do, do you know what's going on? Oh yeah, he says, that statue used to be in a park over here up until 42. Then before the war, they moved it to another park over here. And they had such and such a car posed in front of this big statue, you know. <laughs> well, the, the coolest one I ever remember is they had an old, those old uh, trucks, the beer trucks, must be a German brewery that understood, and it was one of these trucks that was just totally like with the barrels piled as high as you could see, and it says, the caption said, uh, like, beer delivery truck with chain drive and hard wheel tires, and so I thought that was pretty, quite a lot of fun with that. So I, I turned in my work, and they paid, they paid nice. Had the pictures blown up, and now when you go in the dealership in Manhattan, there are 20 pictures are hanging on the wall with my captions underneath. So I, I just did stuff like that. And, but they learned they could count on me, and especially because I go back so far, I'm older than almost anybody that works there. You know, so the, these, this 28-year-old gal, she doesn't know the history. Um, so I did more and more. And every year, for 61 years, Daimler AG, the company, the parent company, had given out an award called the Silver Star Award. And they'd given it to the single employee, non-employee, single non-employee around the world that had done the most to advance the Mercedes-Benz brand. And a lot of times it goes to their big uh, Formula One drivers and their big uh, pro golfers that got the Mercedes logo on their sleeve. And in those 61 years, only three Americans had ever won it. Which I thought was kind of crazy because America is their second largest market. There's nobody else even close. So I thought uh, there should have been a whole lot of more Americans on there. But in, in 2017, I won it. And I was presented, you were kind enough to come a long ways. John Waldy, another great friend, came a long ways that night on a cold night to be a part of the reception and receiving the award. And what that did is that really changed me. I thought that that just vindicated my life's work. It just said, yep, yeah, you're okay. So there was two, there's two people, there's the Jim Lukens before that award, and there's the Jim Lukens after that award. Because in the early days, I admit I was driven, and I pushed hard, and modestly, you, you can't change the world without ruffling some feathers. It's just not possible. So, um, I'm sure that there's some people that don't have the best memory of me, but whatever. But then after I got the award, then I said, okay, 
Um, I was 70, exactly. I said, okay, let's just take it a little easier. And I still push pretty hard, but nothing like I did in the old days. So I'm pretty tickled, got it on the wall, and um, just pretty thrilled and honored, like all these things. You know, you had to be in the right place at the right time, and then produce. No matter what story we tell, it's always the same formula. And that's my formula. How did you figure out that you had a knack for telling stories? You know, uh, once again, that's a gift. It's not, I, I thought I was going to be an accountant. All my learnings are in math, because I'm good at math. I never took any journalism courses or English classes or anything like that. But it really, I gotta say, it comes back to my mother. My mother was very talented. My dad was very rigid, twice as rigid as me. But my mother was very talented. She was adopted and uh, by an older couple. And she went and sent her to a finish, finishing school. They could afford whatever. They gave her the very best of everything. That brought out her talent. And as a result, I think that's where the talent came from. You know, I, I started with uh, Rick Green, Fast News in 03. And at that time, I'd never written anything, of, you know, weekly with a deadline. That was kind of new to me. But he was at Martin when they had the IHRA points meet there. And he said to me, can you write something for me every week about the IHRA? I said, yeah, yeah. I don't know how, but I, yeah, I can do it. So between the, the days of the races, Bob Fry would do uh, an HRA column on Tuesday. I would do the IHRA column on Thursday, turn them in every week. Well. If you remember back to when Bob Fry, who's a great guy and who helped us a lot twice, um, he had a column called Did You Know? And his column would say, well, did you know that this is Connie Kalita's 47th trip to Gainesville or whatever, and did you know that he set the low ET in 58 or something, and did you know what? Well, I, I thought, well, first of all, I don't have any interest in copying Bob Fry. He's already got that little niche. He's way smarter than me. He's got way more statistics, so there ain't no sense in taking him on. But I thought there's great stories. And there's great stories that aren't being told. So I just tried to pick out people, tell their story, just like you're doing. And it, it worked out pretty well, very well. Um, eventually, Bob kind of came around a little bit of that it was less than just numbers. And then in, in uh, the late 2000s, 07, 08, I got real sick. And it, 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 once again, it was all, it was a good fit. I couldn't travel as much anymore. IHRA was winding down as a pro professional category sanctioning body. So uh, once again, I was there. I was there when they had a need. And when I couldn't do it, they couldn't do it. So it was a, every spot, I just marvel at how perfect, not just to get in, but how perfect my timing was to get out. So from your comment, I have two questions. Number one, what makes a great story? What makes it compelling to you? People. You know, it's not about running a 632 ET or whatever. It's about all the stories of all the people that what they went through to get to there. There's a fellow last week to put up a story about a Dodge drag pack. He just set the record. And he said all it took was 10 years, three cars, six engines, and two transmissions. And after 10 years, he had the record that he started out for. Well, everybody's stories like that. There's all sorts of twists and turns, and um, all you see is a car going off the track. You got a winner and a loser. At the end of the day, you got a victory circle. But 
is hard. And I thought there was great merit in telling, once again, the sacrifices, like you do, of all these people, of what they did to get to where they're at. Nobody's a really a ordinary success. Now, maybe Billy Meyer, but other than that. <laughs> Well, Billy might have had a little help with uh, well, I, Fred J. Meyer. Certainly, and certainly he had the uh, the finances, so he hit the ground running and, and uh, was a success from day one. In fact, he was just honored as a Hall of Fame inductee at Garland's Banquet this year. So, uh, but everybody's got a story. Sure. And I thought there was merit in fleshing out that story. Now, I talked to a fellow. Pretty famous funny car racer, and I, I, I made a page of notes. There was nothing. There was nothing to work with. So I just said, hey, thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Appreciate your help. But I never, he didn't give me anything to go with. See, part of being telling a story is you got to have some things to knit together into a story. If you got nothing to build on, then you got nothing. So, but from early on, I just figured the, story, the people were the deal. Uh, certainly, you discovered that with your series. Um, there's great stories out there, and the stories never end. Never end. There's stories being written this year, which is a year unlike any other year in history, drag racing history, whatever. Your story. A few years back, about 12 or 13 years ago, could have had a much different ending. You were very sick. Yeah, yeah, I was. Then actually, I got sick in 07, and I've been sick um, some more or less since then. But I, what I call the big one was in 09. And I went to the SEMA show. And um, I was really sick. But I thought, you know, I'm going to go home in a couple of days. So I'm not going to seek help out here. But as it turned out, it was really bad. I went home. And actually, <laughs> as a part of multitasking, at that time I was on a Mercedes-Benz board. And um, they had their annual board meeting always in November always the same that same first week of November um, later on a few years later several of us got to take it, got them to take it off a of SEMA week so I sat in St. Louis spent a couple of days there and now this part gets emotional I got really bad and I couldn't get warm my body was shutting down and I had a little Kia Soul for a minute car. I just sat in the Soul. I ran to here. I couldn't get warm enough in the room. We're at a Hilton. But I sat there and ran to here. Fell asleep. They had a big closing banquet. A couple of friends of mine from Cleveland said, Where's Jim? He, he's, he, he's here. We know he's here. He's got to be here. Why isn't he at the banquet? So they came out and they found me sleeping in the Kia, pie shutting down, and they rapped on the window and they woke me up. They took me inside, helped me get inside, and um, I had a flight like at 7 o'clock, I had to be there two hours early, I had to get up like at 4 o'clock Sunday morning to fly home. And they said, oh, we'll drive you to the airport. I said, oh, I got my own rental car. You ain't going to make it. And in St. Louis, the airport's not that far. So um, they did. I came home. They took me by 9-11. First time I'd ever been in an ambulance. And when I got to the hospital, the lady said I was 1% alive. I, I was so passed out, I didn't know that. I heard that story later. Um, everybody thought it was dire. I was too really stupid to know it was dire. I never thought from the very first day that I was going to walk out of there. I, I just, there was no other alternative. I had work to do and 
I never came everything else. Why is this any different? Well, there's a lot different. I was in the hospital for 63 days, more than two months, and uh, when they let me go, I was in ICU with a private nurse for probably the first 30 days, half of that. And they used to, they had one person that watched my monitors out in the hall and they just kept an eye on me. And later on, I got to hear all these stories. And at that time, it was about mm, low 60s, you know. And when I left and they wheeled me out, she says, we, and this is a pretty big hospital, Metro Hospital. We never had any person, any age, any gender, any race, any anything, didn't matter, that fought as hard to live as you did. And I thought just, it was just another day in my life, you know. And I, well, later, I heard a lot of stories. I won't go into all them because there's some good ones. But uh, when I first went there, that was the time of the O.J. Simpson trial. And I used to have erected on my wall behind me all these poles and all these things that were breathing me, breathing me and feeding me and measuring me. And I used to call it Camp O.J. Because if you remember when they had the trial, they built all that ridiculous scaffolding out there in the street to photograph and TV and all that. And I had my own personal Camp O.J. right behind me. But I overcame it. And I've been limited somewhat since then, but I never stopped moving. I just never stopped moving. A new lease on life. Oh, I've had so many. That's my hairiest close call, but I've had others. A little while ago, a doctor said to me, man, and he was serious. Man, you've used up five of your nine lives. You gotta slow down. And that's the truth. One time I was uh, so sick, I was living here by myself, I was single. And I said to my buddy, would you drive me to the hospital? And uh, he lives up just the street. He said, yeah, I'll come and get you. So he did. And I'm on the, all the stuff. And I mean, I'm under the sheet and I'm answering questions. And, and they're talking to me and the doctors come, two doctors come in. And they started asking my friend questions. He said, well, I don't know. I ask him, he's been talking, he's under the sheet, he's been talking. They said, no way, it's flatlined. There's the screen, it's flatlined. I just kept talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, that got a little hairier after that too. But the bottom line is after two weeks, that's one of the shorter stays. I got to go home. Another lease, another live crossed off. But I got four more. So I plan to make the most of them. <laughs> yeah, don't use them up all at once. I'm, well, <clears throat> I'm trying not to. Your drive comes from somewhere. What, what inspires you or who inspires you? Well, there's two parts to that story. That gift came from my father, but he was a huge IQ, 160, very smart. Mine's okay, but he's right up there. But he was so driven and he was so precise that he managed to squeeze the fun out of almost everything because he just... So the, the drive, I would say, certainly came from him. But when I was a Mr. Gasket man, I was in Louisville, Kentucky, and Zig Ziglar was appearing that night. And um, I'd seen him on TV, I'd seen him on 60 Minutes. So I said, well, I'm, I'm gonna go while I'm in town here. And that night literally changed my life. I had the horsepower, I had the talent, but it's just like dragging up a drag car, or lining up a drag car. Yeah. Okay, go. And once I knew which way to go, it changed my life. So quite a few years later, he's dead now. <laughs> All these guys are dead now. Um, <laughs> I went to Dallas, which was where he's from, and he used to have, uh, once a year, he'd have a 
semi-private class for like 12 people. So I went there a couple times, and I, he was pretty modest. And I tried to say to him um, oh, what he meant to me, what he'd done for me, and he, well, he says, you know what they say in the Bible, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And that was, that was my zing moment. I, I had to, I had everything. I just had to get it lined up, just like the drag car on the drag strip. And then once we had the car, and we were in the groove, and we had the traction, pfft, we are off to the races. Anything you would look back on now and wish you could do differently? You know, no. I mean, you know, hindsight is always better. Sure, I wouldn't mind having my copo. I wouldn't mind having this or that, but I made the best decision on that day with the facts at hand on that day. They weren't always right, but I kept moving, and if you get more hits than you do swing and misses, then you're the winner. And I gotta say, years ago, I got a saying that hangs by my bed, and it says, today is over and done with. You let it go. No doubt some absurdities crept in, but let it go. Tomorrow's a new day, and you should begin it well. And I read it every night, 40 some years now, and that's how I live my life. If you look back at your life, you've had mentors along the way. Tell me about the people Oh my gosh, like I say, whether it was Dale Berger Jr., or whether it was Jim Vaughn, C.J. Batten, um, at every point, Zig, at every point, the actual key that I needed appeared, just like Zig says. And I've just been grateful for that. I recognize it. I don't take it for granted. In fact, really what I'm trying to do now is I've got three young guys that I try to mentor. They don't know each other, they come at different times, and we, they're, all, they're all under 25, they're all car guys over the moon, and you don't see that so much anymore. So I'm really trying to nurture that, and I'm really trying, and they're just like a thirsty for knowledge. So you gotta find the right person that'll receive it. There ain't no sense in wasting your breath. I've learned that. And somebody that doesn't care, but you find the right person, you gotta help them. So that's what I'm all about. That's the number one thing I'm all about right now. When you get the chance to mentor other people, what's, what's the message? What are you trying to impart upon them? The same message I'm trying to impart here, that if you got some talent, and you apply yourself, you can go anywhere. The, the application, and you know, there, we've gone through a couple of generations after me, the video gamers and some of the other people. So there's, so there's not that inborn drive that there was 50 years ago. So when you find somebody that still has that, you gotta help them all you can. And that's exactly, just like your viewers, I would hope if they're think, uh, living in some podunk, some town, somewhere like I am, it doesn't matter where you're from. Just take your talents and get to work. And if you do, the results will come. Yeah, you know, I, I never, um, I just followed one step after the other and Wherever it led, that's where it led. You know, I mean, I tried to steer a few things, but basically it was all word of mouth and results. You, get, you produce the results, the world will get around. If you had to tack a mantra on your life and your career, what would it be? Well, I've always said that on my gravestone, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, that's the way I live my life every day. It did, there was nothing that was too much. Um, if somebody, when I was working at Berger, if somebody broke a head on Saturday night and they needed a head at 
But for Sunday, I'd get up out of bed, and I'd go to Berger, unlock it, get him ahead, meet him there at 1 o'clock in the morning or something, and then go home and go back to bed. There was no price that was too great. I never limited myself. I just did whatever it took at that moment to satisfy the customer, get through the day, meet the obligation, whatever it was. Just tried to do the deal. And I, we haven't talked about my ring, but this is a ring that Chevrolet gave me. In uh, 1973, I sold a, with my department, we sold a million dollars worth of parts, high performance parts. And that was a time when we were selling our, our 302 small block, bare blocks for 129, our 427 big block, bare blocks for 149. So it, it took um, a lot of work. Now we sold short blocks and complete engines, lots of stuff, but a lot of them were just the plain old bare blocks. And I still have today, I've had what's called a spondyla, which means that my vertebrae is broken. There's, uh, um, there's five lower and then 18 upper. And that came from lifting all these blocks and short blocks into the trunks of people's cars. Because in the 60s, they didn't drive pickups. You know, they drove a pallet convertible or whatever. They'd come up from Detroit or wherever to get an engine. Somehow we had to get it in the trunk. And we had a electric forklift where we could drive it right to the edge, but at some point you just got to put her in there. And I don't know how they ever got it out because at least we had gravity on our side. But to this day, uh, for a long time I went to a chiropractor three times a week because your spinal cord moves up and down inside your vertebrae and it moves when you move, when you stand up, sit down, anything you do. So you got to keep putting that back in line. You're going to pinch your nerves on your spinal cord. We finally got the vertebrae to figure it out, but it took a long time. And in the meantime, I went three times a week. Um, that's another price. See, whatever the price was, it didn't matter. But just like your racers, none of these things came without a price. And the difference was, or what made me different than some, I was willing to pay the price. But it, what, you know, uh, uh, they had a, Jake had a saying about, um, you know, people, uh, you know, successful people don't like doing the dirty work. Or, or he said, unsuccessful people don't like to do the, the dirty work. And he said, successful people do, don't like it anymore, but they do it. Well, that's the difference. Take your talent, apply it, see where it leads. A few years ago when Ken Owen stepped aside from Racers for Christ, he's a good buddy of mine, and I said, Ken, why are you leaving? And it came as kind of it came as a out of blue as a surprise. He said to me, Well, he said, I, th I think the Lord is saying to me that this drag racing stuff is okay, but you know, I got bigger plans and I'm I'm looking for more out of the talent I gave you. Uh, in, in the long run, I, I never wanted to be that guy that showed up at the end and had the Lord say, boy, I wish you'd, uh, I thought you'd do a little more. So I was driven every day. I never wanted to get to that day with an empty bucket. And just like in the Bible, they took away the talent, one talent from the one person and gave it to the person that had three because they were using it. One person was squandering it. I wanted to be that guy. And every one of your people can do it. They just apply themselves. Find a specialty and apply. Work hard. That's my whole deal. Whatever it takes. That's whatever it takes. No limits. No limits at all.